Welcome to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast. I'm Tony Guerra, the pharmacist and author of the Memorizing Pharmacology book series, bringing you mnemonics, cases, and advice for succeeding in pharmacology. Sign up for the email list at memorizingpharm.com to get your free suffixes cheat sheet or find our mobile-friendly, self-paced online pharmacology review course at residency.teachable.com forward slash p forward slash mobile. Let's get started with the show. Hey, welcome to the Memorizing Pharmacology Podcast. I'm Tony Guerra. I wanted to give you, with the beta agonists, a more general way to look at drugs and uh, remember what you're supposed to know about them. And I'm going to use a mnemonic, I match, but it's actually I-M-A-C-H, and I'll explain what I'm talking about here. So the way that I do this, or kind of put drugs in my head to make it simple and create a story, and I know many of you are like, why am I taking English 1 and English 2 or Comp 1 and Comp 2 uh, to become a health professional? And uh, as an undergraduate English major, although I've got my you know, doctorate in healthcare and pharmacy, my background in English reminds me that you know, to remember something, you really got to get the story together. And the story comes from... I am a considerate health professional. So that's my I match mnemonic. Uh, I couldn't get the T in there. But what we're trying to do is really say, you know, for indications, mechanism of action, which many people overdo. Like you can say, you know, methotrexate is going to affect certain enzyme, but you can just say it's an anti-metabolite. I don't have to get too into it. Uh, or something is cholinergic or anticholinergic. That's the mechanism of action. And some of you call that drug class. So however you want to do that. But uh, we start with indication, mechanism of action, adverse effects. Then some people call this contraindications. Really, I think of it as considerations. Like if the patient is this, then we don't want to give this. But in this exception we might so it's more of a consideration uh, but many times we'll call this a contraindication and we're really being empathetic to what it is that their other conditions are and then health professional so i am a considerate health professional and the h is really just as a health professional what do i need to do to help the patient and that depends on what you do i mean are you a pharmacist physician nurse physician assistant, you know, what, what are you, what are you and what is your role in helping the patient? So indication, mechanism of action, adverse effects, considerations slash contraindications, and then how can we help the patient better take the medicine? And I'll show you how this works uh, with the beta agonist that we have in this uh, group. Okay. So let's just start with, I always like to just do one slide, like what's it for? So indications, when you have something like isoproterenol, which is isoprel, uh, inotrope is in the word, and I'll show you how to do that. But this is something that's you know for shock or you know, bradycardia, those types of things. Albuterol, and we can underline the stem, the terol stem, uh, let's just know it's a beta-2 agonist, uh, which is pro-air, brand name tells you what it's for. Uh, it's a rescue inhaler, so it provides air by you know, bronchodilating. Salmeterol, some people call it salmeterol. I like that the word meter is in there because it's a meter dose inhaler, uh, but that's also a T-E-R-O-L. And so we had this problem with the beta blockers where, wait a minute, you've got albuterol and salmeterol and they're, they do the same thing, but they're different. Why are they different? Well, albuterol is short acting, salmeterol is long acting. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that mechanism of action in a minute. Uh, but usually, salmeterol has to be added to fluticasone. There was a study that showed that salmeterol alone was no bueno. So fluticasone has that sone ending for a steroid. Uh, and then we add these together to get air. So that's what uh, Advair is. But this is that what patients would call a controller inhaler, something they have to take every day, sometimes twice a day, those types of things. And then terbutaline or bricanil, that's uh, subcutaneous. There's some other dosage forms, but that's even more short acting than albuterol. But these are the indications. That's what it's for. But how do we remember all this? Okay. 
Well, the mechanism of action can be really helpful if you know what to look for. So isoproteranol or isoprel, this is that beta-1, beta-2 agonist. So it's going to affect the heart and the lungs. You've heard that mnemonic where you have two lungs. So beta-2, one heart, beta-1. Albuterol, that's pro-air, it's just going to be beta-2. And we'll talk a little bit how that isn't always the case. So beta-2, if it's used properly, but many a patient cannot afford Advair or doesn't take Advair on a regular basis, their controller inhaler. And they need more and more albuterol. They keep complaining that, well, I'm so jittery and just, you know, got tremors and all these things. And that's from coming and, and using albuterol wrong. You're not using it as a rescue inhaler. You're trying to use it as a controller inhaler. That's not what it's meant for. Uh, Salmeterol with fluticasone is Advair. So we have a beta-2 agonist to open up the lungs for a long time and a steroid and so the steroid is to help with inflammation the two components of asthma are that bronchospasm and inflammation and then terbutaline that's beta 2. Okay. so this mechanism of action you're going to see these terms so i just want to make them clear short acting selective beta 2 agonist is a mouthful so we just call it a saba s-a-b-a -A. that's albuterol and terbutaline and then a long-acting selective beta-2 agonist is a LABA, which is salmeterol, not the fluticasone. It just happens to be in there. Okay. All right, so let's start with isoproteranol and the kind of the mnemonic here. So if you take the word isoproteranol and you get rid of the SO, the ER, and the L, you actually have all the letters for inotrope, and that's what it does. So if you don't remember what an inotrope is, it increases the force of contraction of the heart. It's also a chronotrope, which you know, increases heart rate. But uh, again, inotrope is really when we're talking about what it does, um, that's what it's going to be. So if we use our eye match mnemonic here, uh, and I get it, you, you probably get big lists of all these things like, well, it's not that I don't get what the adverse effect is, it's that I don't get which of the 10 adverse effects are in there, or which of the 10 contraindications are in there. And what I like to do is just say, well, let me just start with the ones that I understand based on the mechanism of action so I can make a story. Okay, so I, I put the different types of shock in here, and we're, we're not going to go into that. I mean, you know, you can you know, obstructive, distributive, cardiogenic, hypovolemic, and then you can get into the three types of distributive with septic and anaphylactic and neurogenic shock. That's going way down the rabbit hole. What we want to do is just say, all right, well, what is shock? Well, shock is a decrease in blood pressure. You know, we're going to have a decrease in cardiac output. Well, what's cardiac output made up? Well, that you learn that cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. Well, if we increase the heart rate, we can increase the cardiac output, and we can increase the blood pressure, which does the opposite of what shock is, which is lowering it. And then increasing heart rate, obviously, is the opposite of bradycardia. So when we look at the indications of shock and bradycardia, having an inotrope, that's going to increase heart rate, increase blood pressure, cardiac output, it's a good thing. The mechanism of action, we're going to affect beta-1 and beta-2. So we're going to affect that heart, affect the lungs. Adverse effects. So when you're thinking about beta-1 especially, really think about the CNS and how it just really kind of makes you jittery, increasing that heart rate. So if we're increasing heart rate, what would be a contraindication or consideration? Well, if somebody's got hypertension, we're trying to lower their you know, heart rate, blood pressure, and all that, probably not the best medication for that. And then in terms of how can we help the patient, well, when we get to, you know, you can kind of go in the weeds with shock, but, um, and losing that systemic vascular resistance, but the big thing is that, you know, we, we need to have that volume uh, to make this all work. So we want to definitely avoid dehydration, okay? Okay, with the albuterol, um, Again, this is for asthma, COPD, but this is the rescue inhaler. So this is that short-acting bronchodilating agent. Uh, so it's beta-2, opens up the two lungs. And then again, the CNS adverse effects, you're like, well, wasn't that beta-1? Well, you can lose selectivity if you take this too much. And that's when we would kind of get that jitteriness, the tremors. And then you say, well, how can hypertension be it? It's beta-2 agonist. Again, if you lose selectivity, then hypertension can be an issue. 
And then how can we help the patient? Well, you know, you want to open up the lungs before you take that next inhaler breath. I know some people like to just squirt the inhaler a couple times right away, get it done with, but really let's wait a minute between puffs to, to help open up those bronchi, especially if we're going to use it before the controller inhaler. So better to open up the lungs so more controller inhaler gets to the lungs. And then kind of a, you know, BFO, blinding flash of the obvious, if you're using a beta agonist, you probably don't want to have beta antagonists on board, especially something like propranolol, uh, which specifically goes after those beta 2s. Uh, so it's salmeterol and fluticasone or Advair, same thing. It's an asthma COPD, but the contrast is to that albuterol. This is the controller inhaler, the one that long acting beta 2 agonist. And the mechanism of action, we're opposing both sides of that asthma now with this controller inhaler. The beta 2 agonist, open up the lungs, you know, deal with that bronchospasm. And then the steroid for the as an anti-inflammatory. Okay. Got the little uh, muscled uh, lungs here as an image. And then CNS, when you lose selectivity again, you get that kind of jitteriness that comes along with it. But when we think about a steroid, one of the things that it does, and we use it for, is an immunosuppressant. But if you're immunosuppressing locally, like in the mouth, you're going to get thrush. So that's why the washing the mouth out with water, you know, after each use uh, makes so much sense. And then pneumonia, because again, we're immunosuppressing a little bit here. Uh, hypertension. Uh, so uh, again, that beta one, uh, you know, if we lose that selectivity and diabetics, you know, that especially with when you add some kind of steroid, you're going to get that hyperglycemia. Uh, because, you know, when your body needs, is when your body feels steroid, it's like, okay, well, something's going to happen. I'm going to need sugar for whatever event's happening. So it you know, makes you hyperglycemic, but obviously if you're diabetic, that's an issue. And so again, we've got that beta antagonist we want to watch out for. And here we want to wash out the mouth with water uh, and not swallow, but expectorate uh, and get that out of our mouth so we don't get the thrush. Uh, terbutaline, don't really see this as much, but uh, this, again, bronchospas uh, bronchospasm and asthma exacerbation. Uh, it's a beta-2 agonist. It's even shorter acting than albuterol, like super short acting. Uh, and, you know, we can, again, get those CNS effects when you lose selectivity, but there is a laundry list of adverse effects that can come along with terbutaline. Uh, and then hypertension. Uh, again, we want to watch out for that in diabetics, so it's kind of the same as the other ones. And of course, we want to watch out for beta antagonists. But I put a little image here of subcutaneous versus IM injection. Although they did bring IM back during COVID to avoid using a nebulizer, um, but uh, really sub-Q is where you go with terbutaline. Uh, as always, uh, disclaimer, the information is provided for informational purposes only, not intended to provide, should not be relied for medical or other advice. I urge readers to consult with a medical professional if you have a medical condition. Thanks for listening to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast. You can find episodes, cheat sheets, and more at memorizingpharm.com. Again, you can sign up for the email list at memorizingpharm.com to get your free suffixes cheat sheet or find our mobile-friendly, self-paced online pharmacology review course at residency.teachable.com forward slash p forward slash mobile. Thanks again for listening.